going to open the service with hymn number 70. Bert's going to lead us in that in just a moment in your uh, great hymns of the faith. Holy, holy, holy. And I was just thinking about when King Uzziah died. He became proud and he thought that he could approach God without a priest that God would accept him without a priest. And because of that, the Lord afflicted him with leprosy and he died shamefully as a leper. He was the king of Israel. And in the year that King Uzziah died, the prophet of Israel feared that the Lord would depart from Israel. He feared that the Lord would leave them to themselves. And so he went to the temple to seek the Lord's face. And he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The seraphim, you remember, were hovering over the throne of God, three of them. Each of them had six wings. With two, they covered their eyes. His holiness was so glorious. With two, they covered their feet. They were creatures in his sight. People, men, they were angels, but they were created. And with two, they did fly. And would they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth is filled with with your glory. The reason for everything is the glory of God. And God is most glorified at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, If you'll open your hymnals to number 70, Bert's going to come now and lead us in that hymn. Love and purity. 
church shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Y'all be seated. Robert usually does our scripture reading on the first Sunday of the month. But he's home taking care of Deanna. They were hoping to be here today, but um, um, she's going to need a few more days. She's recovering well, and surgery went as was planned, so we're thankful for that. Um, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 50. Psalm 50. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken. He's spoken in his word. He's spoken by his son. Lord, speak to me. Speak to me. And called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof, out of Zion. Now Zion's the church, and so here's God's promise. Out of his church, where his elect gather together and worship in spirit and in truth. If there's not truth, then God's not in it. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. So the Zion's called the perfection of beauty. <laughs> How can she be? He makes us comely, the scripture says, with his comeliness, with his beauty and his strength. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Our God has come, and the fire of God's wrath has fallen, and it was very tempestuous. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ, as the sacrifice on that altar, consumed the fire and quenched it. There's no more wrath, no more judgment. He shall call to the heavens from above. Think about that with me. He's calling to the heavens from above. That's the Lord Jesus Christ suspended between heaven and earth on the cross crying out to the Father. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It is finished. He's calling to the heavens from above the earth and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of, the blood of goats? Hey, your sacrifices aren't what gives you fellowship with God. Whatever they are, they're not. Offer unto God thanksgiving. That's what we've come to do this morning, to offer unto God, not our sacrifices, the sacrifices of praise, the calves of our lips is what the scripture refers to them as, thanksgiving, thank you Lord for your work of redemption.
offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Are you in trouble? Are you? God's made you a sinner. You got a problem you can't fix, don't you? You're always in need of a Savior. Oh, Lord, save us. Let's pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, what you have called us to do, you must enable us to do. To offer unto you thanksgiving, praise, unfeigned worship. Worship that is done in the power of your spirit and according to the truth of thy word. Lord, we're dependent upon you to make us worshipers. Now we pray that in this hour, you'd be pleased to do that. Pray that you would speak. Pray that you would give us ears to hear. Pray that you, Lord, would save us for Christ's sake. We ask it in his name. Amen. next hymn, we'll just remain seated. Would you take your blue hymnals, turn to number 258. 258. Our only standing before a holy God is to be found in him. 258. He hideth my soul. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. Hideth my soul in the cleft of the He hideth my heart in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior, Jesus my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depth of his love, covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings, Moment he crowned and filled with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God for such a redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. That shadows a dry, thirsty land. 
He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. Will you open your Bibles with me again to second uh, to um, Isaiah chapter fifty-five, and also. By way of introduction, I want to look at a verse or two in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I've titled this message, A Promise to Pardon. A Promise to Pardon. So the question that you and I have to ask ourselves, are we in need of being pardoned? Are we in need of forgiveness? Does the promise that God makes to pardon us of our sin mean anything to us? Is it, is it the hope of our salvation? God makes a precious promise to pardon the sins of his people put them away so that there is now no condemnation. The law has been silenced. God satisfied. The blood of his dear son has been shed. It has covered the sins of his people. So how do I know it's for me? How do I know that I've been a recipient and a benefactor of this precious promise? Well, I think the Lord will answer that for us here in verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. <laughs> this gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is called the ministry of reconciliation. You see, that's our problem, that we need to be reconciled to our God. In another place, Isaiah said it like this. He said, your sins have separated you from your God. Those sins have to be put away. God's justice has to be met. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll begin reading at verse 18, all things are of God. <laughs> of God, for God, to God, all things are of God. All things, no exception. Things in heaven, things on the earth, things under the earth, all things are for him. Psalm 115, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us. This is not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about him. It's about him. 
And that the Lord gives us grace to seek him with all of our hearts and, 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 and realize and discover that this is about him. <laughs> all things are of God. Who hath, past tense, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So we've been called to preach the gospel and to call men, be ye reconciled to God. You've suffered a fall. God leaves you in your sins. You'll, you'll be separated from him for all eternity. We need reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. When the Lord Jesus Christ shed his precious blood on Calvary's cross, God said, I see the blood. I see the travail of his soul and I'm satisfied. And I pass by those for whom that blood was shed. God was in Christ. Christ is God. <laughs> you go reread that in the study this morning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1. Light came into the world, and darkness comprehended it not. Darkness never comprehends light. God has to shine the light of the gospel in the irresistible call of grace, regenerating us and revealing to us the glory of Christ. How do I know if he's done that? Because he's put it in my heart to seek him. To seek him. Reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, not charging them with their trespasses, satisfied completely with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he said, it is finished, it was finished. Everything God requires of a sinner, he looks to Christ for. Now, I can find a lot of hope there. Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Come to Christ. It's the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors. An ambassador can do nothing but tell men what whoever sent him <laughs> told him to say. Ambassadors have very little leeway. When they're asked a question, when they're in a foreign country and they're asked a question, that they don't know the answer. They've got to go back and get the answer from the, from the president or the king that sent them, don't they? Now we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he... God the Father hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, sin for us. Why does God not impute to us our trespasses? Because he's already imputed them to Christ. He charged Christ with them. Christ paid the full debt of all of our sins. For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin that we that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Perfectly righteous in the sight of God. That's the double blessing. In Isaiah chapter 40, when the Lord said, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my tell them the warfare is accomplished. Tell them they've received of the Lord's hand double for their sin. The double blessing is the removal of guilt and the imputation of righteousness. God didn't just take away our sins. He gave us a holy nature. 
God made him who knew no sin, sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now that's reconciliation. And it's the only means of reconciliation that there is. You're not going to be reconciled to God by any other means. Not by anything. That's why in our text, let's go back to Isaiah 55. That's why in our text the Lord said, forsake your thoughts. What are man's thoughts? Well, I can, I can be reconciled to God by a decision I make or by a good life that I live or, 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 or by some uh, knowledge that I attain. I can do something to reconcile myself to God. No, God's the one offended by our sin. You don't, you don't offend someone and then tell them, well, you know, I'm going to give you permission to forgive me. No, it's the one that's been offended that has the right not only to forgive but set down the conditions for that forgiveness. And that's what God has done. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And so we beseech men, be reconciled to God. God's way. God's way. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways. Look, go back with me to um, Isaiah chapter 55. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. I mentioned blind Bartimaeus in the first hour this morning. Um, he lived in Jericho and uh, he heard so all he could do was hear he couldn't see but he could hear he heard that Jesus of Nazareth the son of David the Messiah was coming by and he thought this is my only chance <laughs> I'll not be able to follow him as a blind man I'll not be able to find him again I hear the crowd. I hear the footsteps. I know he's close. I'm just going to cry with all of my heart. And that's what he did. Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Don't presume that you're going to have another opportunity. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. I want you to do something for me right now. Right this minute, I want you to do something tomorrow. <laughs> you can't do it, can you? <laughs> you just can't do it. Nothing's ever been done tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes, does it? There's always a tomorrow, isn't there? And yet men will put off the salvation of their souls for another day presuming that God is going to have grace upon them again. If God has spoken, God has said, come, come. In your heart, come right now just like you are. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. He's near right now. The Lord said in Romans chapter 10, say not in your heart. In other words, don't even think it. Perish the thought. What can I do to bring Christ down from above? And perish the thought. What can I do to bring Christ up from beneath? In other words, what can I do to make Christ come to me? What can I do to make his death effectual for me? What can I do to make what Jesus did work for me? Perish the thought. Don't even think it. What the Lord Jesus Christ did worked. <laughs> he finished the work. And then in that passage it says, Oh no, he is as near unto you as your lips, your mouth your mouth and that's what he's saying 
Ask him. Lord, save me. Lord, have mercy upon me. And this is not a one-time experience, is it? <laughs> it's, it's what sinners are constantly doing. I don't know if I was saved yesterday, but I'm crying out for him to save me today. So you can't live off yesterday's manna, can you? You really can't. We try. We try. I think, boy, that was just a wonderful experience the Lord gave me. And you try to live off of it, and it's going to get full of worms. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. To whom coming, we're always coming to Christ. That's why we preach the same message to believers and unbelievers. Same message. I get accused sometimes. Well, you need to preach to unbelievers, or you, you preach to unbelievers all the time. You need to preach to believers. It's the same message. There's no difference. It's come. Come to Christ just like you are. He delights in showing mercy. He abundantly pardons. <laughs> you see, that's our problem, isn't it? Our problem is not really our circumstances. As difficult as they might be. Our problem is believing God in the midst of our circumstances, and that is the, is the, is the reason for our sin. You, you see, the sin that doth so easily beset every one of us, you know, the Hebrews talks about the sin that easily besets us. And some people think, well, I fought for years in religion. Well, you've got one sin that easily besets you. I've got another sin that easily besets me. And everybody's got their own weaknesses and their own problems. No. Unbelief is the sin that does so easily beset us. And the believer's always crying, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. But the fact that I'm not able to believe God, whatever is not of faith is sin. There's, your pro There's our problem, isn't it? Our problem is not our circumstances, however difficult they might be. Our problem is believing God in the midst of our circumstances. And the reason we don't believe as we ought is because of sin. Lord, there's my, there's my problem. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Don't, don't, don't think, well, my problems are worse than other people's problems. Everybody's got their own set of circumstances, don't they? There hath no temptation to taken you, but such as is common to all men. But God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. Now people stop right there and they say, well, God's not going to put more on me than I can bear. That's not what that verse says. If God never puts more on you than you can bear, you'll never need him. And if he ever puts your sin on you, you'll know you've got a burden you can't bear. So what does he say? God is faithful and not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation, with the circumstances, with the trial, with the difficulty, provide the way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Christ is the way of escape. <laughs> He's the way of escape. And so we're always coming to look to Christ, come to Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, rest your soul and circumstances in Christ. He is able to save to the uttermost and to provide for us everything that we need in life and in eternity. He's able. He's able. Now there's our problem, isn't it? We just, we, we just lose sight of him, don't we? Call ye upon him while he is near. <laughs> he said, you suppose there's two or three of us here that are, that are worshiping him in spirit and in truth right now? I know there is. I know there is. So what did the Lord say? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He's here right now. 
And so he says, while he's near. So I'm calling on you. I'm, I, I know it's just an outward call. I know it's just an audible call. But it's the means by which the Lord makes the effectual call. Irresistible, isn't it? And so we call men to come. The prophets of God have always done that. Seek ye the Lord. Don't seek a change in your circumstances. Don't seek better life. Just seek him. Seek him. He's the one that's ordained your circumstances to be exactly like they are. To make you seek him. Lord, I'm so full of unbelief. Help thou mine unbelief. So on the authority of God's word, I say to you and to myself right now, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Right now, while he's near, in your heart, come to Christ without moving a muscle. (laughs) Believe on him. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Return. (laughs) Now that's true for every person. Every person. This is a call for every man to come back. Come back. Now I'm not much on conspiracy theories. I mentioned this recently. Uh, number one, I don't think men are smart enough. And number two, because they can't, they can't take into consideration all the unintended consequences. You look at some of the decisions that were made by world leaders in years gone by, they had no idea what was going to happen. They're doing the best they can do, but it, that's just about what it is, isn't it? Number two, they're not powerful enough. And number three, they're not able to keep a secret, okay? You, you, you want to keep a secret and you tell one person, you better kill that person because the secret's going to get out. Isn't that the way? Yeah, conspiracy theories just defy all logic as far as man's power and man's knowledge and man's, the man's ability to keep it. He, he just... Now, that having been said, there is a conspiracy that started in the garden. And it has deceived. You see, because the source behind this conspiracy is not man, it's Satan. It's Satan. And God has given him the power to deceive the world. Now the Lord says, forsake your ways. What is the way of man that is not God's way? Look at the next verse. We're going to, I'm going to answer this question in just a moment. Uh, For my thoughts, verse 8, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. What is man's way? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Because man has no love for the truth. Christ is the way, he's the truth, and he is the life. And because men have no love for Christ, God has sent them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. What is the lie? What is the conspiracy? What is it that all men believe that's contrary to what God has said? Well, it goes all the way back to the garden. It goes all the way back to what Satan did in the garden when he said to Eve, God knows In the day in which you eat of that fruit, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. Right now, you're just puppets. Right now, you're just blindly following after God. You've got no free will. You're doing everything God says to do without thinking about it. And God knows in the day in which you eat of this fruit, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to have free will. 
You're going to be able to discern the, the right from the, from the bad and, and then you'll make right choices and then you'll be virtuous. <laughs> that was the temptation. He thought, well, when she saw that the fruit was, was good to the taste and pleasing to the eye and able to make one wise, she took it and she did eat it and she gave it to Adam and Adam ate it. And the conspiracy hasn't changed. However long we've been here, the conspiracy is the same today as it was all the way back there in the garden. It hadn't changed. Men believe that they have the power of free will to determine the destiny of their own soul. They believe that. They really do believe it. They believe that they can obligate God with a decision that they make, a prayer that they pray, a work that they performed. They, they believe in free will. Now, man has a will. No question. You know you've got a will, don't you? The problem is it's not free. It's bound to our nature. God's the only one that can set us free. <laughs> and what does he say? Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to free will. Don't go back to the law. Don't go back to works. And God says, forsake your ways. My ways are not your ways. The only way you're going to come is if I give you the new birth <laughs> is if I open the eyes of your understanding and unstop your ears and take out your heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh I've got to do the work <laughs> and I'm going to do it all forsake your ways what is the way of the world well John summarizes it in 1 John when he says all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the world. That's not God's way, that's man's way. And everything man does is motivated by the lust of his flesh. That's pleasure. It's motivated by the desire to be Seen of other men. That's the lust of the eyes. I'm lusting after your eyes to look on me. That's popularity. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's power. I want power over my circumstances. I want power over God. I, 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 I'm going to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and, and, and I'll have control. And that goes all the way back to the garden too, doesn't it? When Eve saw that the fruit was good to the taste, that's pleasure. Pleasing to the eyes, that's popularity. And able to make one wise, that's power. That's the way of man. That's the way of the world. And it's the cause of all our problems, isn't it? When Christ is the pleasure of the Lord... <laughs> He's the one that we want to be seen in good light with, isn't he? If God be for me, who can be against me? Though the whole world turn against me, if, I, if, I'm in, if I'm in good graces with him, if he sees me, and he's the one that's got the power, isn't he? And so when our Lord began his public ministry, what did he do? He publicly was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. That's what he told John. Suffer to be so that we might fulfill all righteousness. It's, the, it's not your baptism that saves, it's his baptism. When we baptize, when we, when we submit to baptism, we're identifying with him, but we're looking to his baptism for our salvation. And then he came forth out of the water and immediately he was driven into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil for 40 days. And what happened in the wilderness? At the end of that time, at the end of 40 days, weak, hungry, the devil came to him, didn't he? 
If thou be the son of God, turn those stones into bread. I know you're hungry. I know you want to gratify your flesh. And what did the Lord say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. No, I'm not going to be tempted by that. Well, let me take you up on the pinnacle of the temple and you can cast yourself down into the Kidron Valley and all the people down there will see that you are the son of God because, because the angels are going to catch you and you'll not dash your foot against a stone. And what did the Lord say? Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I'm not tempted. I'm not tempted to, to have the a pleasure of men. I'm here to please God. And so they took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the nations of the world. And Satan said, bow down and worship me and I'll give you these. You'll have power over these. <laughs> worship as it is written. Worship the Lord thy God and him only thou shalt thy serve. Depart from me. You see, what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished in, that, in those temptations was what you and I have never been able to do. We're still struggling with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, aren't we? That's our problem. The Lord Jesus Christ was never gratified his flesh outside of the will of God. He never sought the approval of men outside of the will of God. He never, ever took power away from God. He always glorified his father and he laid down his life willingly for his sheep, didn't he? Now, who do you want God to look to for you? That's why he said, return unto me. You see, the truth is that all men need to return. <clears throat> why is it that all men know that there is a God? Because there was a time for all men when in the loins of their father Abraham, Adam, I'm sorry, they walked with God. There was a time before the fall when every person had fellowship with God. So the Lord's calling to the world Return to me. You fell in your father Adam. You lost fellowship with me. You chose the lust of the flesh, the pride of the eye, the, the lust of the flesh, the, the, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. You chose pleasure, popularity, and power over my word. But I've sent a Savior. Return. Return unto me. Forsake your evil ways. Forsake your free will gospel. Forsake your works mentality. And look to the Lord Jesus Christ for all the hope of your salvation. Look to him and live. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. There is a way that seems right unto man. But in the end, uh, that way leads to death. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh, as the rain cometh. When was the last time any man had anything to do with when it rained, where it rained, or how much it rained? Never. Never. And so the Lord's using this, this, this power outside of the control of man to illustrate salvation. And he says, he says, for as, uh, um, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but watereth the earth and maketh it to bring forth bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word that be it that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing 
wherein I sent it. <laughs> what a glorious promise. The word of God's like the rain. You can't control it. You can't figure out how much of it you're going to get or when it's going to come or where it's going to come. The Lord controls it. Now what does that do to a believer? What does that truth do? Does it cause you to say, well, you know what? I'll just go by home and sit on my hands and wait for God to do something. You know what this glorious truth will do for one of God's elect? Cause them to seek him with all their hearts. Lord, you've got to have mercy on me. Prayer is nothing more than the expression of a mercy beggar. It's the, it's, the, it's the expression of one who's completely dependent upon the one to whom he's praying for all blessings. Lord, you're going to have to send the rain. You're going to have to speak to my heart. You're going to have to open the windows of heaven. I believe that your word will not return unto you void. It will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. It will prosper. <laughs> it will prosper. Lord, make it to prosper in my heart. And save me. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. Lord, make your word living and effectual in my heart. Cause it to be a double-edged sword. Cut away my evil thoughts and give to me hope in Christ. And when the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate word of God, returned back to heaven, he did not go back empty-handed. Oh, no. He prospered in what God had sent him to do. He went back with the names of those for whom he lived and died, and he presents them right now, right now before the throne of God as our intercessor. He's a prosperous Savior. For you shall go out with joy. Rejoice in the Lord Always? Always? Lord, do you know what I'm going through? Of course I know what you're going through. I put you, I'm putting you through it. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord's at hand. The Lord's at hand. For you shall go out with joy and be led with peace. That's what I need. I need peace. I need peace with God. I need to know that all things are well between me and him. Well, that's what he said. You go out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall clap forth before you into singing. <laughs> now, what are those mountains? Those are the obstacles, aren't they? If you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed and said unto this mountain, be ye removed and cast into the sea, it'd be thrown into the sea. And the highest mountain, the highest mountain on earth, Everest, you put it into the depths of the ocean and it's going to disappear. You know what the tallest mountain in the world is from its base? Hawaii. Hawaii, a whole lot taller than Mount Everest. <laughs> so you take all the mountains, all the things that would separate us from God and throw them into the ocean. And they would disappear. God says, I've cast your sins into the depths of the sea. I remember them no more. Now I can have peace with God if he's buried my sins and forgot them, separated them from me. The mountains shall break forth unto singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. These are the trees of righteousness, which are the plantings of the Lord. Look what he says. Instead of the thorn... What happened in the garden as a result of the fall? 
You're going to labor by the sweat of your brow and it's not going to produce anything but thorns and thistles. And that's what religion is. Religion is man trying to earn favor with God and not being able to produce anything fruitful. Thorns and thistles is the only thing that comes forth. Instead of the thorns shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. (laughs) It shall not be cut off. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. This is a promise to pardon. Forgiveness of sin. Peace with God. Everything here is for that purpose. All of creation everything that happens in providence and every man, every woman, every child that's ever been fashioned by the hand of God exists for his glory. What what hope? What peace? Our merciful Heavenly Father, We know that what you have called us to do, you must enable us to do. So we ask that your Holy Spirit now would make us willing in the day of thy power. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table. So I'll ask the men if they'll come forward. Bert, you're going to lead us. Number 17 in the spiral hymnal, number 17. table spread before you see the feast of bread and wine these are symbols of our Savior tokens of his love divine bread that's broken is his body Crushed beneath the wrath of God, wine poured out is a reminder of our Savior's precious blood. Children of our God, remember how He bought your soul and mine in remembrance of our Savior. Eat the bread and drink the wine. Jesus came, God incarnate, to fulfill God's holy law. On the cross he made atonement and retreat us from the fall. Let us ne'er forget the promise Jesus made to come again. Soon he comes our King to call us home to glory Praise his name with this hope and expectation. We rejoice to keep this feast. Celebrate.
awaiting our redemption. Oh, we lean on Jesus' breast. John said there's three in heaven that bear witness to the gospel. And that's the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And, uh, and then he went on to say, and there's three on the earth that bear witness to the same gospel. And that's the Spirit. It takes the Spirit of God to preach the gospel. It takes the Spirit of God to hear the gospel. The water, that's our union with Christ in baptism and the blood that's the lord's table that's uh, when i see the blood it all points back to that precious blood of christ that was shed on calvary's cross doesn't it you see the testimony is simple christ is the testimony he is the witness god has given him to the people as a witness and his witness is his life symbolized in this unleavened bread God made him who knew no sin sin often as you do this do it in remembrance of me Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. God had to slay a lamb in the garden, didn't he? Clothed Adam and Eve with the proper, proper clothing. The men are still trying to cover themselves up with fig leaves, aren't they? But, uh, only that spotless fleece, robe of righteousness from the Lamb of God who was out spot and without wrinkle will be sufficient. Blood had, blood had to be shed. The Lord said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Let's stand together. <clears throat> David, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Thank you.